So welcome to today's webinar resident series. It is successful impression techniques, traditional impressions in the 21st century. It is being presented by our very own Terrain Watkins, CDT, Clinical Director of Guided Surgery and Implant Solutions. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, be with us today. So we're going to talk about physical impressions. Uh, we'll talk about materials, then we'll talk about techniques and potential problems and impressing for crowded bridge removables, implants, and full arch cases. As we go along, the things that we learn will kind of build on each other. So um, some of the stuff we cover for fixed, we'll use that as our assumptions for uh, removables and implant techniques. So I am a full-time employee of National Dentex, and so I've been paid to do this presentation. Um, we don't have any other financial support from any vendors or anything like that. So uh, just so you know where uh, our where we're coming from, I love history. Anyone who's listened to very many of my presentations knows that uh, always start out with a little bit of history. So dental impressioning in the U.S. started out in 1787 with a beeswax impression technique uh, that was adapted from a uh, what this doctor learned about in France in the mid 1750s. Um, Reversible hydrocolloids that we use still sometimes use for duplicating in the uh, dental laboratories evolved in the 30s. Alginin impressions came in in the, in the late 40s. This is interesting because in those days, dentistry is primarily focused, as I'm sure you guys have learned, on uh, removables. So the 50s was when um, we started doing a lot more with fixed restorations. I worked with a laboratory that was kind of there. At that point, and believe it or not, we were using alginate as an impression material for fixed crown and bridge work. Um, of course, there were rubber base and some other materials in that area. Um, the beginnings of modern impression materials uh, kind of emerged in the 50s, but they weren't as accurate as the uh, as the earlier the alginates and the like. The first modern impression material, polyethers, uh, came out of the market in 1965. They have a good mechanical strength and elastic recovery and virtually no shrinkage. One of the things to keep in mind is they are hydrophilic with good flow characteristics. Um, you'll, you'll still see those. There's a couple of polyethers out on the market, and they are very, very accurate. They tend to be very hard. So um, if you have a lot of undercuts to capture, that can be a challenge. But they, when mixed well, they're still very, very accurate. Uh, BPS came along in the 70s. And of course, that's what most of us use most of the time. Um, the one thing about a BPS that's interesting is it's intrinsically hydrophobic, but there are oftentimes surfactants added to it to allow us to use it more effectively in the wet environment in the mouth. Probably the last physical, who knows, but the last physical um, impression improvement we'll see is at the end of the aughts, the VPES, trying to combine the, the benefits of polyether with vinyl. Um, and it sounds like it's a good material. I, I haven't done enough with it to be able to speak to it a lot myself, but it just in reading about it, it sounds like it's, it's functional. It's not as revolutionary as you might think. And so since folks are really comfortable with, with uh, VPS, we tend to be sticking with that right now. Um, why in the world are we talking about physical impressions in 2023? With the latest generation of iOS, can't we do everything digitally? Um, from a philosophical perspective, and you guys know this is, you know, just completing dental school, that a lot of the goal of dental education is to give you tools in your toolbox. So when you deal with a situation, you have a, you know several different ways of approaching it. Um, you're going to find that at some of your practices, you may not have the latest uh, iOS uh, technique or equipment rather available at this point. But you also are going to probably find some solutions where having a physical impression material really helps you out. Um, if you have really deep uh, margins, um, fractures in the, in the proximals, different things like that, 
sometimes it's difficult to get a dry field. And if you have a pool of fluid and you take an intraoral scan, the top of the pool becomes the margin, which can lead to short margins. So especially being able to use a hyperphilic material, you can sometimes capture margins more accurately in difficult situations with physical impression than with even the latest generation of iOS. Um, one of the things we're still not quite there yet is a direct iOS for a denture. So what we find, even doctors who are very, very capable with iOS find that because we have to move the tissues around, it's difficult to get reliable uh, removable impressions with iOS. Uh, probably the state of the art, I would say today, is to reline a denture and then do a 360 scan of it. So a nice mucostatic impression today is still best done with physical impression materials. Um, and then full arch is kind of the same thing. There are some, some ways of doing a digital capture that require either proprietary scan bodies or um, expensive single use uh, equipment or sometimes both. So if you splint all your impression copings together, take an open tray impression with a accurate material, I think most people would say that's the most predictable way of capturing um, all on X impressions today. So saying all that to say that even if your office has the latest and greatest iOS, you'll probably still find some areas where it's handy to have physical impression material. All right, so we'll be kind of talking through taking impressions for different kinds of products, but these are things that are important in every case. Uh, the mix is very important. So most of the materials you're using today are auto mix, but even with those, we've got to make sure to express a little bit of material before we start doing the impression to make sure that we get good mixing. Um, if you use a material, there are some you can purchase that require manual mixing. So you've got to make sure your ratios are perfect so the catalyst works properly. And then we also want to think about a lot of the techniques that we use today are four-handed techniques. So we want to make sure that the that the materials that you and your sister are using are well matched to each other, both being from the same system, having the same set speed, et cetera, et cetera. Impression trays. We'll talk about this quite a bit because they're critical. They're the foundation of your impression. Um, it has to fit well. If it's too big, especially too big in some areas, you're going to wind up with potential inaccuracy because thick areas are going to set differently, um, have different levels of expansion than thin areas. Um, make sure we want to use our uh, impression adhesive many times so that our uh, material doesn't delaminate from the tray. That's really important. We also got to fill the tray all the way up. Details. One of the ways that we'll be able to tell how good our impression is is by looking at our impression under magnification. If you notice in this, you can see this crisp border around the impression. You can see details of the preparation. In general, a an accurate impression has more detail than one that is um, not what we need. Uh, and adaptation is really important. Uh, we need the base material to adapt well to the impression tray. We need the wash to adapt, like in this impression, seamlessly to the base material. We need good adaptation to the mouth. And so we'll talk about some details of that in a minute. But when you're looking at and thinking about taking your impressions, these are kind of your foundational things you want to deal with. So we'll start by talking about crown and bridge impressions. And uh, again, the foundation is the tray. Not a lot of offices use these metal trays anymore, but you gotta say, it's pretty hard to distort a metal tray. So again, if we think of our, our tray as our foundation, we wanna make sure that our foundation is solid. Um, so we wanna make sure that when we select a tray, it's well adapted to the mouth, so we don't have really thick impression material, which is both expensive and limits accuracy, but we don't want it to be so tight that it, can potentially interfere with the patient's tissues and kind of create a preload that leads to warping, um, especially if we're using a triple tray. Um, we also want to make sure that um, that we're that it, it's adequately adapted to the patient's mouth, so we don't again have really thick areas and really thin areas. 
since most of our impressions are going to be taken with VPS, we also want to pay attention to our gloves. Latex will inhibit the setting of VPS material. And so it's best not to use latex gloves at all. If for some reason you need to, make sure you don't touch the impression material or even the retraction cord because the latex material that picks up on the retraction cord can limit setting of the material right down there at the margin where we really need it. Retraction is critical to an accurate impression. Before you take your impression, you want to look and make sure you can see the margin all the way around. Um, if you have a super gingival margin, of course, this isn't a problem. Um, but most of the time, we're working with sub gingival margins, and we need a visible gap between the tissue and the preparation before the margin is taken. Well, one thing to keep in mind is when you're looking at it in the mouth, you can see pink and you can see white. So you're like, oh, okay, I can see the transition. And on the model, it turns out it's all yellow, green, pick whatever color you want. So to make sure that we have full extension of our restorations to the margin, we need to be able to see some differentiation between the margin and the, um, and the surrounding tissue. Um, as you guys know, retraction cord is somewhat, uh, you and your patients probably would prefer zero cords. Um, us laboratories, we love two cords because that gives a beautiful margin, um, but it can lead to recession as some studies have shown. So um, you kind of need to look at the situation and use the least amount of cord that you can to still get accurate retraction. There are some uh, syringable materials that will work well in some situations, um, such as Exposil and some others. Um, Whatever retraction material you use, you got to give it time to work. So uh, paste is about two minutes, while cord's three to five. Um, if you're using the double cord technique, uh, wet and remove the larger cord right before taking the impression. It gives you 30 seconds to take your impression. Um, Prepreg cords with uh, hemostatic agents can be really helpful. Like we talked about, if you use a hemophilic impression material, that will definitely help kind of pick up any excess fluid that might have been expressed after you've dried everything and while you're actually in the process of taking the impression. Uh, most offices today, I would say, use a uh, heavy body, light body, four-handed technique. Um, I mentioned this before, but I'm gonna talk about it again just because I've seen this problem before. You wanna make sure your medium or your heavy body that your assistant's gonna use and your light body that you're using are from the same manufacturer, have the same set. Usually you want them from the same system. You don't wanna use a slow heavy body with a fast set light body or whatever um, because you're not gonna get really good adaptation of the two materials. Wanna check your expiration dates. And also if you're storing your impression materials out of your office, make sure that the temperatures don't fall above or below the uh, recommended materials. So offices that are really good at their impression taking, a lot of times it's almost like a ballet. They'll, so you and your assistant will start at the same time and while the tray's being loaded, you'll go ahead and inject your light body in the sulcus and then up over the preparation, the adjacent contacts. Um, Use a little compressed air to blow that material down to get a little extra adaptation to the tooth. That's a technique that can really help you. And then once you load the tray, make sure, you may not have even seen these before, but I was younger offices that use these. Now most people use their phone. But you want to make sure that when you start mixing that you or your assistant sets a timer. So that way you know for sure you've given the impression material enough time to set. Um, the more that you are consistent, the more that you're able to use a material that everybody's good, good at, the better results you're going to get. Um, of course, you need to be aware of your patient's gag reflex. Patients that have a strong gag reflex can be difficult to compress. Sometimes an iOS will work a little bit better for patients that have a severe gag reflex because you don't have to touch the tissues. Um, if you're doing a physical impression, sometimes you can use, especially for crown and bridge cases, you can use a lower tray and just cut the wings off the lingual side so that we have something to kind of capture that impression material so it doesn't even extend onto the palate. Um, of course, with these patients, it's better to have them set up and even sometimes forward. And 
a lot of times distraction is your friend. Um, you can tell them to wiggle their toes. You can tell them they got to breathe through their nose. Um, some of these things help with gagging, but most of the time it's just to take their mind off their troubles and help them a little bit. Obviously, fast set material is going to be a little bit better in that situation. So when you're taking an impression for a full arch case, you want to think about if you had to articulate the model made from your impression, could you do it accurately? Um, us still laboratories, of course, we're going to ask for a full arch on all cases because uh, that gives us the best occlusion, allows us to see the contralateral teeth, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the reality is, is that most of the time we're getting um, quadrant impressions, partial arch impressions of some kind. Um, and so when you take those impressions, you need to look at the dental situation, make sure there's enough teeth. Um, so we have some solid bites in the posterior for, um, you know, holding our models in the correct position while we're making the restoration. We want to make sure we can pick up excursive guidance. And if we're doing an aesthetic case, we need to see the contralateral too. Um, if you, if we're doing number six, we really need to see number 11. So that way we can uh, mirror it and make it look nicer for the patient. Otherwise, we're kind of blind when we're doing our contours and the case may not look as well when we're done. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is that if we have a case, even if the bite is accurate, we don't have any posterior teeth. So let's say we have a case that ends at the first premolar in terms of occlusion and we're doing a, well, you wouldn't have an opposing tooth. But every once in a while we have cases say where the patient has a second molar, no first molar, no second premolar, and um, the last teeth that really occlude other than the ones we're restoring are in the anterior. That can make the articulation less stable. So uh, make sure you get us enough teeth to be stable. So I'm talking about impression, I'm like, I want them big. Interestingly, with bites, we want them as small as possible. When we're articulating the case in the laboratory, all we need is the part of the bite that sits on the occlusion of the prep. So really, when you're taking your bites, just capture that little bit of area. It helps you and it helps us. So for you, you can make sure that the patient is fully closed because sometimes they'll bite a little bit different with impression material in there and you can't see that. Um, and for us, it allows us to uh, fit the rest of the teeth together and make sure that especially the teeth posterior to the area we're setting are occluding properly. If, when you look at the bites you get back from your lab, you'll find that they're usually trimmed down small like that. So you can uh, help yourself out by using that uh, smaller bite. Uh, so we're gonna, next we're gonna talk about uh, any kind of problems that can occur with the impression, kind of what might've caused them and what to do about it. Um, these, although most of the pictures you'll see are related to crown and bridge impressions, they're relevant to any kind of physical impression. So we'll kind of use this as a troubleshooting segment for our whole, uh, our whole impression taking process here. So the first thing we want to look at is tray contact. Um, show this can occur for several reasons. A uh, tray could have been hold, held too firmly, patient made a bit really, really hard, or um, we, maybe we didn't put enough impression material in there. And as we even mentioned, the tray could be a little bit small. Um, so when you're looking at this, you have to decide, is the tray contact going to compromise the accuracy of the impression. And here's the thing. If the person is biting on the tray and the tray is a flexible material, which is most of what we're using these days, um, we've put spring pressure into it. Um, maybe I'm not using quite the right terminology, but the tray has a preload. So when we take it out of the mouth, the tray itself is going to compress the impression and compromise the accuracy of it. What that does is it makes the impression smaller than the mouth, the die is smaller than the tooth, and it can create a restoration that doesn't fit. Um, so if you're using a quadrant, a single-sided tray, and you held it with light pressure and you get some contact, probably isn't an issue. As long as it doesn't compromise the accuracy of one of the teeth or a tissue area that we need will be okay. However, like in this situation, if this is a triple tray, and you can see that this 
back arm, see how it's sticking up above the impression material? This means that the person put quite a bit of force on it when the, uh, when the impression was taken, and it's probably not going to be accurate. What's worst about these is that the impressions look good. They're just dimensionally inaccurate. So uh, in this particular case, I'd recommend retaking this impression. So you're going to see a few of these related to the margin. And I'll try to mention how to kind of diagnose which one it is. So that way we can kind of figure out what might have occurred. So in this situation, you have very good detail of your impression, but it's all kind of ragged. And what's happened in this situation is we've had good adaptation to the tooth, but we haven't had accurate extension all the way down to the margin. Um, could be caused by not enough retraction or maybe fluid contamination in the margin, or maybe we didn't get our impression material all the way down in the sulcus, or it could have even torn. Usually we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. That looks a little bit different. Um, most of the time when we see this, we'll have to retake the impression. And of course, you'll want to make sure you correct whatever was going on that caused that. So voids are different. You're like, well, what's different between this one and the last one? And what's different is you'll notice that these areas look very smooth. They don't have that same detail. And this can also be caused by uh, fluid contamination, but it can also be caused by our impression material setting up too early. If we're using a fast set and we're a little bit behind on our technique, the impression material doesn't flow as well. Um, it could be caused by storage temperature, Obviously, if we overheat our impression material, it's going to set up faster. Um, or it could be that we didn't get enough hydraulic pressure from our tray. Either our tray isn't well adapted, wasn't loaded all the way, whatever. This is something that by using that blowdown technique we talked about, it'll help with that because it forces the material down into the sulcus. An impression like this, most likely. Now, in this particular case, you can see the margin below. So this one might have worked, but in general, you, the margin hasn't been captured, so you'll probably have to retake it. So tearing at the margin. So this is a little bit different than uh, some of the other problems that we've seen. Um, it's either caused by the impression material not polymerizing or it getting trapped or it not being strong enough to resist the forces pulling the impression material out. So, um, and usually if it's not set up, you'll be able to tell because this will still be a little bit tacky down in here. Um, sometimes when you have really nice retraction, the material can get down quite a ways along the axial walls of the tooth below the margin and uh, get captured on the way out. So we wanna kind of have a look at these impressions and see, is our margin captured? If you can see the margin all the way around and the tear was past the margin, Good, fine, it'll be okay. Um, if the margin itself is torn, as you can see in this photo, then of course we'll need to retake that. Um, and then irregular voids in the impression. There are several things that can cause this. One is if our impression tray is underfilled. Another one is if we load it too late or, or insert it too rapidly. And the last one that you see a lot is if we reposition the tray after we put it into place. Once we put the tray in place, we want to hold it. We don't want to shift it for a little better adaptation or whatever, because that can lead to these kind of voids. A lot of times you'll see these voids in non-critical areas. For instance, let's say you're doing an impression on number three, and you see this in the mesial of number five. As long as it doesn't affect the bite, it doesn't really matter. It'll be okay. Um, we'll talk about partials in a little bit, and partials are more picky with this kind of stuff because there are so many areas that are critical to fit. Um, but again, these are ones where if you look at it, you're like, ah, oh, it's a non-critical area, it'll be fine. Don't worry about that. Delamination. This is a huge problem. Um, this can occur if we use materials that have different, from different manufacturers, different types of materials, different set times. Um, again, the best way to do this is by using the same system and putting them in at the same time. There's also a technique that was more popular a few years ago where you take your light, your heavy body or your putty impression at the time of, before you prep the case to make your provisional, then you'd reline it uh, with the prep. 
I really, really don't like that technique. Because what happens in practice is that the wash material balloons, the body material during the impression, it has the effect of making the dye undersize. When that happens, you're going to have an, a poorly fitting restoration. I would strongly avoid recommending, I mean, recommend avoid taking that, following that technique. Um, impression material not set. Um, could be caused by latex or acidic hemodosis materials or acrylics, all those that can mess up BPS. Uh, could be expired material, material that's stored too low, or um, maybe if we didn't express a little bit of extra material before we started taking our impression or our impression material coming out uh, too early. All these things, the impression's no good. You've got to retake those. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, impressions for our full dentures. Uh, as much as possible, when we're doing a full denture impression, we want what we're going to call a mucostatic impression. So this is one where our material sits on the tissues and doesn't, de doesn't depress them. So uh, the best way to do this is with a kind of a two-step impression using border molding. So that way our sulcular tissues kind of provide a stop and allow us to get the most accurate impression we can. Most of the time, there's a couple exceptions, but stock trays are not the best for edentulous patients because they're designed for dentate patients and you're going to wind up with a lot of material um, on the crest of the ridge, which can lead to inaccuracy. Um, when you're using a custom tray, you want to make sure that's a little bit short of the vestibular borders because you're going to want to pick that up with impression material. So in this case, we've done the first step of border molding. So what we'll do is we'll paint that border with our impression adhesive, use a heavy or a medium body, usually a heavy body material there, and then just express it onto the borders, put the tray in the mouth, gently seat it, hold it ourselves, not with fusel force, and then have the person go through um, a variety of like maybe a Duchenne smile. Um, we want to uh, move the jaw side to side and uh, maybe pucker their lips. We're trying to activate all the muscles so that that way this border shape is dictated by the patient's musculature. Um, once we go through those movements, we'll paint more adhesive over the whole thing, put our light body in there, and then go through those movements again. And so how that helps is that this border is then we know it's in the exact correct position. And that way, when your technician makes the denture, you can tell them just duplicate the borders of the impression and it will be perfect. Um, for a maxillary impression, keep in mind that in the laboratory, it's very difficult to see the vibrating line. So if you can mark that for us on the impression, it'll make uh, the palatal border much more accurate and less likely to be dislodged. So you're looking at, here's some old rubber-based material. I don't know if you even get this stuff anymore, but um, when you're looking at a full denture impression, how do you evaluate it? So you wanna make sure that the tray isn't showing through. You wanna make sure that it's smooth. It has well-defined peripheries like we talked about. And um, we don't wanna see any voids or drags or tears. We wanna make sure that we have nice adaptation on the whole surface of the impression. Partial dentures. In some ways, partial dentures are the most demanding impressions you'll do because it's like you have to do a crown and bridge imp quality impression for the whole mouth. There are so many different areas where we need to pick up rests and guide planes and things like that. Um, a lot of times doing a custom tray impression will help you out on these cases because it'll allow, it'll make sure that your impression material is uniform thickness and that much more accurate. Also, it'll, um, it'll support the edentulous areas and um, allow you to pick up the borders. Uh, on a case like this, your borders are not gonna be as important because this is gonna be obviously fully supported by teeth. But a lot of times you'll be doing uh, cases with uh, single or bilateral free ends. And on those cases, we'll, we'll need to be making a tissue supported partial. And so we need those nice borders. Um, 
if you have large undercuts in areas that we don't need, um, we're not going to be putting the partial on the tooth. You may want to use a little bit of orthodontic wax to block those areas out so that you can take the um, take the impression out easily. Um, when you're choosing your impression material, uh, PBS works well. It's accurate. It also has, this is a polyether, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult to remove with a partial because the material is pretty hard. A little bit more springiness, uh, resilience is going to help uh, with the uh, removing the case. Um, one thing to keep in mind is let's say you want to use a stock tray. You can use compound or putty and adapt. Like in this case, you can put a little bit of putty here, here, and here with a sheet of plastic like you'd use for packing in a denture. Sit it in the mouth, let it set up. That way you've kind of done a do-it-yourself custom tray so that these areas don't have so much impression material. If you do that, just make sure that there's a gap between the putty and the arch so that that way you can have a fully continuous impression. So with your partial denture impression, you want to make sure that there are no voids where the partial is going to be content. This is a good example of what not to do. You can see we have a variety of voids here. Um, you don't want to see tray contact like this. Um, you want to make sure that all your landmarks are visible on the case. So you can see that we didn't pick up the vestibule here. So really, like I said, in some ways, your partial impressions are going to be your most difficult because you really have to pick up everything. Um, when you're taking a denture impression, there's a variety of landmarks we need to do a good job for you. We need to get the whole vestibule, the tuberosities, the hamular notch. And again, we need uh, to see where the vibrating line is so we can end the denture in the correct spot. Um, you guys have way more anatomic knowledge than most of your lab technicians. And so sometimes if you can help your team, your laboratory team, by uh, kind of pointing out, hey, this is where I'd like my uh, prosthetic to end, it can help get a much more predictable result. On the mandible, one of the areas that doesn't get picked up a lot is the retromolar pad. That's important not only for extension of the border, but when we're doing a double arch case, we'll set the plane of occlusion halfway up the retromolar pad. So if you make an extra effort to capture that, it makes a big difference. Another thing you'll see is a lot of times you can capture the retromylohyoid fossa. And so sometimes laboratories will extend their mandibular dentures past the mylohyoid ridge. That's another area where sometimes you can coach your laboratory and say, hey, so you know, it'd be good to end that uh, denture right at this ridge here. So um, one other thing, uh, you wanna make sure you capture that buckle shelf, because as you know, that's where a lot of our stability is gonna come from, from our mandibular dentures. And so uh, that's really important again for your laboratory. So let's talk a little bit about impressioning for implant. Um, the best impression for an implant 2023, I'd say, is an iOS with a scan body. But if you're doing physical impressions, you want to do an open tray. Um, open tray impressions are one where, as you can see in these pictures, the impression coping actually protrudes through the tray. That's really important. The reason these are better is because once the component is picked up in the tray, it never moves. So when the model is made, the component is in the exact position it was in in the mouth. Um, we'll talk about how that's different from a closed tray and why this is really important. Um, in general, when you're taking Im implant impressions, you have to have components. You can't take an impression without a component. So if a patient shows up, you don't have the correct component, may as well send them home. You're not going to be able to, except in a couple of rare instances like uh, ENCODE, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, you won't be able to take your impression. Um, so to take your open tray impression, you're going to remove your healing abutment, set it aside. You'll fix the open tray co component to the implant, ensuring that the impression coping is fully seated and you'll finger tighten it. Then take a radiograph. You can't see the interface between the impression coping and the implant. So you have to take a radiograph to be sure it's fully seated. 
the majority of the problems we have with implant cases are due to inadequate seating of the impression coping. So that is probably the most important step in this, in this process. Once it's fully seated, you'll seat the tray, cut a little hole, doesn't have to be as big as this, <laughs> so that the, um, so the impression coping protrudes to the tray. Then you'll go ahead and use your four-handed technique, have your assistant load the tray. You'll syringe a little material on the body of the impression coping right here where it comes through the tissue and usually a little bit on the adjacent contacts and seat the tray. Use a cotton swab to clear this area when the tray is seated. And then once it's fully seated, you'll go ahead and unscrew this guide pin, the screw in here, and take it out, put it in a little box to send to the laboratory, then remove the impression. What you'll find is that this coping is then locked in the tray. It never comes out. That's the key to accuracy. On the other hand, if you're using a closed tray impression, and there are situations where you can't like this, this material wouldn't pull out of here. You'd have to use an open tray for this. Um, you're going to follow the same technique in terms of remove the healing abutment, seat the closed tray coping, take an x-ray, make sure it's fully seated. And then when you actually take the impression, you can leave the tray intact and you'll remove the impression from the impression coping. Now you'll send the whole impression coping to your laboratory. And this is where the inaccuracy can come in. In the laboratory, we have to screw the analog on here and then we have to seat it back in the impression. And we can't see it. So you, at most laboratories, there's only a couple people that do this because you have to really, really know what you're doing. Um, but even still, you can get a little bit of material in here. Sometimes these copings don't seat very positively. So you kind of put them in there, you look under your magnification and you kind of give a little wiggle woggle and it pops into place and you hope that it's accurate. Um, I've never found a hope to be a predictable strategy. So this is where potential inaccuracy comes from. So when you're working with these cases, you can really help yourself out um, by using open tray impressions. Um, with an open tray, if the crown is seats twisted or the bite is really high, most of the time that's a seating issue. When you're taking the impression, you'll need to take a new one. With a closed tray, it's possible that the laboratory wasn't able to load your impression coping correctly. Um, in either case, most of the time, especially if you look at the crowns, like it's a little bit turned, you're going to need another impression. Something was wrong with the original seating. Again, make sure you take those radiographs to check them. Bites are really important with implant cases. Um, a lot of times you'll get cases like this where the bite is much less stable. And so as you can see in these pictures, a good technique is once you have your impression coping seated in the mouth, um, and you've taken your radiograph, before you take the impression, just take a quick bite. You'll be sending these copings to your laboratory, and so your lab can use those to stabilize your bite. If a technique like this won't work, and you have a case like this with a long free end, sometimes you'll wanna take an alginate study impression before you take the master, and then have your laboratory make a, a bite block like you would for a partial, just to stabilize the bite. Again, kind of look at the case and say to yourself, could I get a perfect hand articulation of this myself? And if your answer is no, then make sure you get your laboratory a bite. We find that we struggle a little more with bites for implant cases, uh, crown and bridge type implant cases than we do with um, tooth borne cases. So be a little more aggressive with providing bites to your laboratory. Um, Problems again are the components not seated. Again, this is an external hex, so this is harder to see in um, in radiographs with modern internal components. But if you see a little gap there or whatever, it's not seated. So don't take your impression. Get it back out. Get the tissue out of the way. Whatever's going on, that can be important. Um, component interference can happen sometimes. So if the implant's placed at an angle and you find that your impression component is hitting one of the contact teeth, you may need to relieve some of that to make sure that the component seats passively. Uh, keep in mind, if you're using an iOS, you cannot modify the scan body. If it interferes with the adjacent teeth, you're gonna have to use a different component because a modified scan body is useless, but you can modify physical impression components. 
Um, and then wrong components, make sure you look at the information from your oral surgeon to make sure that you get the exact correct components. With platform switched implants and so many systems out there, you want to make sure you have the right impression filter. Um, I'm going to flip through real quick and just show you what the components look like for some of the major manufacturers in all these images. The healing abutments on the left, then the, the scan body, then the closed tray coping, then the open tray coping. So this is Noble BioCare. These are Strauman, the bone level on the top, the BLX on the bottom. Tissue level from Strauman, sometimes called Synoctas. Uh, Zim Bs. This is an encode healing abutment. This is the one exception to using components. If you get a Zim B implant that has this, you can take a physical impression of it or a scan of it the way it is, and it works as a scan body to uh, position the implant. Uh, BioHorizons, Densefly Astra. So impression for full arch cases. If you're gonna be supporting your surgeon, you want to make sure that your pre-surgery impressions have long borders, like what you take for a denture, even if the patient's dentate. So there are a couple reasons for that. One is that, that you may need a denture as the provisional restoration. Once the teeth are extracted, the implants are placed if we can't uh, immediate load the case. Um, and then you also want to keep an eye on the bite. Most of these patients have lost some vertical, so make sure you provide your surgeon with a correct vertical dimension of occlusion, which may be an open bite. So that way the initial provisional restoration, be it a screw retained or a denture, gets the patient in the correct vertical while we're doing the, uh, while, while they're healing. Um, when you're taking your, once your implants are integrated and you're taking your master impression, you always wanna take an open tray on these cases. Don't do closed tray, only open tray. Um, you'll be taking an impression like a um, like you're doing for a crown and bridge case. Uh, a lot of times people like to use, you can see custom trays on these. Um, you'll want to make sure you use your light body around all these impression copings and that you, um, and then you use your medium body, pick up your borders. Again, a radiograph, very important. Um, you'll find that if there's fit problems with these, they're very difficult to deal with. Your laboratory will provide you with, and I'll show you in a minute, a thing called the verification jig to double check this. But nonetheless, it's, these impressions are really, really important. Um, as you're working more with full arch, you'll find that the bite is the thing. Like it's the most important part and sometimes the most challenging. If you've worked out the bite in the pre-surgical stage, at this point, you're just trying to replicate what the patient's been working with. But again, make sure that you're getting the patient to the correct video, that sort of thing. Um, when, after you've done your impression with a full arch case, the next appointment will give you a verification jig and usually a screw retained bite block. And as you can see, your bite block is like you'll use with a denture, you want to get the correct lip position, plane of occlusion, um, sizal edge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, make sure you use your data about bite opening to get the person in the right position. This is a thing to make sure that the model and the mouth are the same. And so what you'll do is you'll screw all these temporary cylinders to the MUAs in the mouth, and then you'll take out all but one and do a radiograph. It should seat perfectly with only one screw in place. If it doesn't, there's a difference between the model and the mouth. You need to figure out where that is, cut this, screw all the pieces down and loot it back together. This step is really, really important because we wanna make sure that the model is a perfect replica of the mouth so that when we make the final restoration, it fits perfectly. Obviously there's a lot more to full arch dentistry than this, but I, as I was talking about impressions, I wanted to kind of do a brief. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for joining in today. Really appreciate it.